series is a wonderful partnership between the Trout Lake Station, Kemp Station, the Monaco Public Library, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the Monaco Brewing Company. In fact, it was uh, Tim had this wonderful idea several months ago now. And the whole idea really was to try to get scientists and citizens together talking about various environmental issues in the Northwoods. And the key word there is talking together. This isn't, and you'll see from our presentation this evening, this is by no means a seminar or a lecture. This is a discussion. And ideally what we'd like to have is a conversation about specifically tonight change in the North Woods. So the format, as Mary mentioned, very, very informal. I'll probably natter on for about five or ten minutes or so. I'll turn it over to Tim. He'll uh, talk for a little bit. And then we'd, we'd like just to have a conversation talk about some of the changes. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to ask questions or also to share some observations that you have about some changes that you have seen in the North Woods. So when we talk about change, and the whole focus this evening is going to be on change, we need to put that change in some sort of context. And what we need is a starting point. And the starting point that we've selected is 150 years ago. So we're going to start with about the mid 1800s. And in the mid 1800s, northern Wisconsin was a wild frontier of forest that was interspersed with lakes and bogs and wetlands and barrens. In fact, researchers have estimated now, they've gone back and looked, they figure about two thirds of the forest that were present was either old or old growth forest. So forest that's over 120 years old. And about one-third was young forest, aspen, birch, some spruce, some fir, and some jack pine. Now across all of northern Wisconsin, the most prevalent tree species were sugar maple, hemlock, and yellow birch. Now here in Vilas and Oneida counties, the most prevalent tree species were red and white pines. This was the heart of the pineries. And it was soon that this, this area, particularly the pineries, are soon to come under the national spotlight. And the reason why it is because in the late 1800s, the Midwest was growing rapidly. The major urban centers of Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, they were growing at a phenomenal rate. At the same time, we had the march of agriculture across the, 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 the treeless prairie that frontier. So all of these people, they needed buildings to work in, they needed homes to live in, and the North Woods was to provide that raw material. So beginning in the late 1800s, what we saw was the widespread harvest of northern Wisconsin. And for several years, Wisconsin led the nation in lumber production. But what happened was that that harvest was occurring at such a rate, at such a level, it couldn't be sustained. In a matter of just a few short decades, that entire frontier of large old trees was exhausted. 
that was harvested. So what had been the economic base in the late 1800s, early 1900s of, of lumbering, that disappeared. So the residents of northern Wisconsin were looking forward to a different economic base. They were looking for another way to have economic activity in this area. And with the forest depleted, what happened was the lumber companies and the land agencies begin, began to tote northern Wisconsin as a place to turn this cleared land into farms. And believe it or not, University of Wisconsin played a big role in promoting northern Wisconsin as a place for farming. The very first Oneida, excuse me, the very first extension agent, an egg extension agent, was placed in Oneida County, not down in the south where all the farming was, very first extension agent all of Wisconsin was here in Oneida County in 1911. Well, despite that agent's heroic efforts, many of the farms failed, and they failed really for three reasons. First, the farms were located too far away from markets. Second, as you're all aware if you spend your winters here, is that our growing season is too so short. And the third is that the nutrients in the soil were soon depleted farming. So because of those three reasons, many of these farms failed, many of the farmsteads were abandoned, and the land became tax delinquent. Now what happened was a large portion of this tax delinquent land passed into public ownership. And it explains why today we have such large public ownership in this area. The Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, Northern Highland, American Legion State Forest, and our system of county forests as well. Well, beginning in the all oh, early 1900s, mid 1910s or so, Northwoods was beginning to be then developed as a tourism destination. So we tried lumbering first, exhausted the resource, tried agriculture, that didn't work. So then we turned and focused our attention on tourism. And tourism really caught on, and it caught on quite quickly, for really three reasons. First, we had a relatively close urban population in Milwaukee and Chicago, a large urban population. And at the time, people were beginning to earn higher wages, and they were beginning to work shorter work weeks. So the combination of those two made it possible for people to have more leisure time and to spend their money on their leisure third thing that was going on was that there was a shift nationally in people's, call it people's values. There was a desire to get out of the city and get back to nature. And what better place to get back to nature than here in northern Wisconsin? So the tourism industry was very actively developed and fostered, both by local businesses, but also by local governments. In fact, Oneida County was the first county in the nation to adopt a comprehensive rural zoning law. The year was 1933, and the purpose of that rural zoning law was to keep Oneida County primarily forested and sparsely populated so that it would be attractive for tourism. The first in the nation. Well, there were three other shifts that began to emerge in the early 1900s, from about 1900 through until about 1930. One was that the forest began to recover from this extensive logging. All the clear cutting that took place and the burning that followed created ideal conditions for sun loving tree species, tree species like aspen and birch. So the forest began to recover. That was the first trend that began to occur. The second was Wisconsin's forest industry adapted, began to change. Again, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was focused on lumbering, and it shifted, it transitioned to pulp and paper. In fact, Wisconsin soon became one of the leading manufacturers of pulp and paper in the country, a position that it still holds today. The third thing that started to happen again in the early 1900s, and this might be a surprise to you, is that the Northwoods began to emerge as an environmental laboratory. In fact, Tim will discuss some of the, the Trout Lake Station's early history. And it's that early history of environmental science that really contributes to our, really, our rich legacy of 
research here in the Northwoods that for many people remains unseen. So we started with forestry, lumbering, shifted to agriculture, then transitioned primarily into tourism. Now, prior to 1940, tourism was really a lot different than what we see today. Previously, tourism was resort-based or camping-based. This was a hard place to get up to. And when people came up here, they tended to have extended stays. They would stay a while. But beginning in 1940, that shifted. After World War II, we had post-war prosperity, and we had the development of the interstate highway system. So here was a case now where, again, people had more disposable income, and they had the means, the ability, to just nip up north for a weekend. And what we saw was tourism shift from that resort base to more a case where people were buying properties and building cottages, having their own little essentially their own little resort, their own little piece of nature. And the focus changed from extended stays to weekend visits. And this cottage development really continued at a moderate pace <coughs> through the 1940s, the 50s, and the 60s. And through the 1970s, it really began to ramp up. And what fueled it in the 1970s was the emergence of two-family income. Now you had both spouses at home working, more disposable income, and again, an increased desire to get away and experience and enjoy nature. So beginning in the 1970s, we saw a big housing spike here in the Northwoods. It continued along, and then we saw another spike in through the 1990s. And that particular spike coincided with the run-up of the stock market, where there was more wealth, were feeling wealthier and taking some again, some of their wealth and investing it in second home properties. And these changes from the early 1900s through to 2010 are reflected in these housing maps. And I'm just going to cycle through these maps. This is a map from 1940. And what it is is a map that shows housing density data. Red, you see the maroon or the red color, this is where there are a lot of homes scrunched in per square kilometer, per square mile. The black or the green shows you where there is very limited housing density. So very, you can think of it as being very sparsely populated. And what I like to do is just go through decade by decade so you can see the differences in housing density here in the North Woods. So 1940, oh, I should point out, you can see our urban centers, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Madison, a little bit farther north of Madison, Stevens Point, and again, a little bit farther north, that would be Wausau. Those would be the small red blotches that you see. So let's cycle through. There's 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, and again, it was through the 70s that we had that first big pulse of housing development up north. There's 1980, 1990, and now you really see greater emergence of red in the north woods. 2000, 2010. That's how the Northwoods has changed. Would you like to see projections for the next four years? <laughs> Here's 2020 and 2030. Now that's just one, we call that one attribute or one metric. That's just housing density. Think of all the people that's reflected by those homes. Well, let's return to today. Here we are, 2013, and the forests of today have recovered remarkably over the last 100 years. Think back, 1913, this area, the Northwoods, this was really a barren expanse of smoldering stumps. It really was. You could stand just outside Boulder Junction and see the water tower in Arbor Vita. If you were to stand in the same location today, you'd be lucky to see 100 feet. That's how well, how, how quickly and, and really thoroughly the forest has recovered. 
So what we have today really is a healthy and maturing and thriving forest. But it's important to point out that the forest that we have today is considerably different than the forest that we had 150 years ago. It's different in terms of its composition, the tree species that we see here. It's also different in terms of its structure, the size of the trees, just the range of sizes, the way that there are canopy gaps in the forest, the amount of down logs on the forest floor. So while we have forest today, and again, it's recovered quite remarkably, it's much different than 150 years ago. The other thing that we're seeing today is that we're seeing the emergence of different environmental threats or natural resource threats that were nowhere present 150 years ago. What are some of the things that we're seeing? Well, we're seeing a loss of species. We're seeing particularly some ground flora. We have very high deer populations, higher than what have been normally or historically uh, present. And as a result, we have some ground flora that are disappearing as a result of all the deer feeding on them. We now have the introduction of invasive species. On the terrestrial side, a good example, garlic mustard. Tim will talk about some of the aquatic invasive species that we see. We see habitat loss. With all of these people coming in on the landscape, the landscape has changed. It's become more fragmented. And as a result, there are some bird species that are losing their habitat. Species that really, we call them interior forest songbirds. They like big blocks of undisturbed forest. So there, there we are facing some threats. We see forest parcelization. We're now a single landowner might own 10, might own 40 acres, whereas, whereas historically, a parcel size under an individual ownership might have been 40, 80, or 120 acres. And we're seeing something else called homogenization, where now our forests really across the landscape are much, I'll say much more similar, they're much more uniform, whereas previously there was greater heterogeneity so the last 150 years has been an extraordinary period of change for our woods. And most of this change has been driven by human activity. Originally, logging for lumbering, then agriculture, and then tourism. Today, logging, support of our forest industry, and tourism, excuse me, remains our economic base here in this area. But over the past 150 years, our human activities have had just an incredible impact on the environment. Now, I focus just on the terrestrial side, the wood side. I'll turn it over to Tim at this point, and he'll talk about some of the impacts on the water side. Thanks, Tom. So one of the obvious features of the landscape up here is the thousands of lakes. And there have been, actually, if you sit down and count them, and if you count all of the small ones, it turns out that in Vilas and Oneida County and parts of the adjoining counties, there are seen a little bit more than 7,000 water bodies. 7,000. Um, and that feature of the landscape has been very important in its, in its um, history and how, and how humans relate to it. So I would, I'm not a betting man, but I would wager that um, the majority of people in this room today are up here in some way or another because of the lakes that are in this area. If you're up, let's see if I'm right. If you're up here in some way or another because of the lakes, because of the presence of lakes, raise your hand. Yes, I was the way. <laughs> I should have gotten more. <laughs> and so, so there's this real interesting relationship between the natural resources, in this case the, the lakes, and people. The lakes have clearly affected people's behaviors, they've affected all of yours, but people also affect the behavior of lakes. And so trying to understand that reciprocal relationship is something that's been very interesting and um, that relationship has evolved over the years. As Tom mentioned, the North Woods has been Sort of this seems like an oxymoron, but it's been a quiet hotbed of scientific activity. And starting in the 1920s, 
the, um, the first scientists came up to this area to have more or less a permanent presence. Um, they established the Trout Lake Station. It was in the 1950s that I think Camp Station was, was established. There are not many regions of the state that have two full-fledged university field stations in such close proximity, um, and this is one of them. And that's a great resource for the, for the community. But in the 1920s and 30s, um, the early scientists went out and made observations of more than 500 of our lakes. And those records still remain um, and are invaluable resources for the present day against which to measure change. Um, the good news is, in some cases, for some attributes, the lakes haven't changed very much. The bad news is that in other attributes, they've actually changed quite a bit. And we can talk a bit more about that um, tonight. But having that scientific tradition, along with the tourism and the, and the timber industry, the forestry industry, is a real interesting in the juxtaposition. Um, and it's one that, that I think affords this community um, ample opportunity for reflection upon change. So the lakes are, are focal points for people. They're also a focal point for residential development. So in science speak, we humans tend to colonize lakes. You know, we, we build houses around the shoreline. Um, and when we do, that has some implications. Um, the, both the number of, of residences um, per, say, unit length of shoreline has been increasing, but also the intensity of, of that development has been increasing. So in the 30s and 40s, as Tom alluded, you might have had a small cabin um, that may or may not have had plumbing, probably didn't have electricity, and was up, was just sitting back in the woods, nestled back away from the lake. That has given way to large houses with lawns that go down to the lake edge, and boat docks, and, and lots of people, and a lot more of those. Um, so the intensity um, and the amount of residential development has, has increased. Um, it's caused a couple of issues. One is as people use the lakes, there's something about something about our culture that um, makes us want to tidy up after nature. <laughs> um, it's a it's a funny thing, but I bet I bet you recognize this. So, you know, think of a wilderness a wilderness lake, and think of what the shoreline might look like. There probably be trees, there might be some dead trees that have half fallen over, there'll be some unsightly snags that are sticking out of the water. Um, that's sort of a wilderness look, and you know it when you see it when you're out on one of those lakes. Contrast that to a lake that has a lot of residences on it. The trees are all nice and tidy, the dead ones have been cut down. If there's a tree that fell into the lake, chances are it's been removed. Um, there are piers, um, there are boats sitting there. Um, there are often lawns right down the lake edge, sometimes not. Um, really a different picture. Um, that tidying up after nature um, causes habitat loss. And it turns out that some of the habitat in the shallows of the water, the water that's maybe you know, foot deep to hip deep, turns out to be really important habitat um, for all kinds of organisms, including fish. And so, for example, we've done some studies that have shown that in, in lakes that don't have much of this woody habitat, individual fish grow about three times more slowly than in fish with a lot of that habitat. So, the irony of this people, natural resources, coupled system, lakes attract people, people build houses, they, because they want to be on the lake, they tidy up after nature and harm the characteristic that, they, that first attracted them up to the, up to the area. Um, and yet we continue to do it. Um, really interesting irony. Along with this increased residential development and the tourism um, base, is an increased risk of spreading non-native species. And on the aquatic side, there are about four to six pretty bad actors. Some of them have been in the area for quite a while, decades. Others that are just moving into the area and their effects are, are not yet really well understood. Some of the bad actors are rusty crayfish. That's one that's been up here for 40 or 50 years. Rusty crayfish come into a lake and the weed beds disappear. 
and it has an effect on fishing and other, other aspects. Rainforest smell. They're in about two dozen lakes in Wisconsin. Um, they're in the Great Lakes. They're not native to this area. When they come into a lake, yellow perch go extinct. Um, the cisco or lake herring go extinct. Walleyes fail to reproduce. Um, if there are about 500 lakes in North in Wisconsin that the rainbow smelt could live in, the ecological characteristics are such that they could, there are about two dozen now. We're right at the start of the spread of this. Um, now's the time to get a handle on it. Really a bad actor. There's Eurasian water milfoil, which is probably the one that's that um, most of you recognize. Of course, that that species in lakes where it flourishes can can come all the way up to the surface and essentially clog the lake um, for boating um, um, sorts of sorts of uses, and, and it can be unsightly, and it affects property values. Um, and there are a few other species as well. With this, and of course, also with all, with all of us being up here, there's an increase in fishing pressure, and that provides another stress on lakes that makes it, makes lakes more vulnerable to to uh, change to uh, invasive species and other change. So all of these things are are kind of bad attributes of all of us being up here. The good attributes is that as we've seen the change, people have become more sensitive to environmental change. Um, and we've responded. We've done things like form lake associations. We've done things like form town communities. <coughs> where we can assess and reflect upon what we as a society are doing or not doing um, to our lakes. And all of those things, I think, are, are positive developments. And my guess is that the political power of well-crafted lake associations um, or, or town committees is only going to increase as the pressure on our lakes increases. The, uh, there's a, a body in Wisconsin, it used to be called the Wisconsin Associated Wisconsin Association of Lakes, and it's now called Wisconsin Lakes. Apparently, they're no longer an association, but Wisconsin Lakes. Um, they have an annual convention. Something like 4,000 people go to it. Just normal, normal folks um, go to it. Um, important political clout, um, and that's something I think that that um, is an interesting development. So one of the things that, that the scientific community has tried to do over the over the, the 80 years or so that, that we've been here is to try to understand the role that people play in the environment, how, how that modifies how lakes behave naturally, and also trying to understand how lakes behave naturally, even in the absence of humans. And people aren't the only pressure that's affecting lakes. Um, you may have heard of climate change. Um, it's alive and well in the Northwoods. Um, the, uh, um, if you look at the water temperature data um, for lakes in this area, um, it's been increasing over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, um, clear, clear change. And, and this is not just isolated to the Northwoods. It's, it's all over. There is no doubt that, that our climate is changing. Um, and most scientists would say there's very little doubt as, what, as to what the cause is. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to stop, and I think we should have a conversation. Perfect. That's your cue. <laughs> <laughs> and we mentioned how this is very informal. Mary has gracious, graciously provided pretzels and root beer back there yeah. and drinks. So by all means, feel free to get up, stretch your leg, and have a drink, which is what I'm going to do. Um, and let's talk. Yes, uh, an opportunity to go to the Adirondacks about four years ago for the first time. And we stayed at this wilderness lake with this beautiful 100-year-old setup, okay? There were zero fish in the lake. And I was told that there are 500 lakes where the fish are gone. Not, not partially gone or some gone. They're all gone. Now, can that happen up here? So, <clears throat> do you know what the cause of that? Acid rain. Acid rain. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so acid rain is the process by which um, either sulfur species, chemical species, or nitrogen chemical species go up into the atmosphere, get transformed, and um, come down in rain, and it comes down in acidic form. And depending on the chemistry of, of the area in which those raindrops fall, um, it can
and acidify the environment. In the Adirondacks, that's just downwind of the Ohio Industrial Valley, um, the acid rain problem was severe and still is severe. Um, more severe than here, we're upwind of the, of the Ohio Industrial um, Valley. Um, but so, so that was the issue in the Adirondacks. Here, um, in the late 70s and early 80s, the, uh, the pH or the acidity level of the rainfall was something like, it was something in the low five, if I remember right. I might have that number wrong. Um, it's been a while since I had to think about this. Um, but um, because Wisconsin had a history of what I would consider foresight in its policy. Um, and because the acid that was falling in Wisconsin was largely sulfuric acid, which comes from coal-fired power plants by and large, in the mid-80s, Wisconsin passed a sulfur emissions bill, which essentially set a limit on the amount of sulfur that could come out of the stacks of the coal-fired power plants. That, admit, that was one of the first, first states in the nation to do that. Um, the Clean Air, amendments to the Clean Air Act at the federal level used Wisconsin's legislation as a model. And so the emissions of, of sulfur went down. Basically, it forced the coal, the coal-fired power plants to find lower sulfur coal and also to put scrubbers on their stacks. So the acid rain um, throughout the US, but particularly in Wisconsin, went down. Um, it was never at a level where it was a big threat to acidify the lakes and forests in northern Wisconsin. Um, there were there's some evidence of some slight acidification, um, but um, but now it's it's pretty much not an issue in northern Wisconsin because as a society we collectively took steps to see that that wasn't going to be the case. Is there anything in our you know, soil and the water? that helps us in any way, or are we similar to upstate New York? Um, so upstate, upstate New York has um, uh, thin soils and very little buffering. Here we have a lot of sand that goes down to about, I don't know, almost 100 feet of sand down to bedrock, but that sand also has very little buffering. Some of the lakes here, and it's kind of an interesting but long story as to why some lakes are sensitive and some aren't, um, if it gets slow, I can go into that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, some lakes here are very sensitive to, to being acidified. Um, some of the soils are. Um, but the levels of acid that were falling out of the sky were never high enough to really cause a lot of damage. We sort of nicked it in the bud. We caught it early enough. One, to me, that's, that's one of the few environmental success stories we've had. And that's not that black and white. There's S3 is still an issue, but thank you. Wasn't there a thing, though, back in the 80s or 90s about Trout Lake and you couldn't catch or you couldn't eat rye under or over a certain length because of acid rain? So um, you're probably referring to the mercury limits. Um, and I believe that those limits are on most, if not all, lakes in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and there is a link between the amount of acid in the lake and the amount of the poisonous form of mercury that accumulates in fish tissue. Um, so that linkage is clear. Um, but again, I think Wisconsin has been somewhat progressive in understanding the problem, trying to do the research to understand the mechanism, and then also putting out advisories um, to try to keep people out of harm's way with the mercury. Uh, here in like the Milos County group, it's basically a pine forest. Uh, is that uh, due just to the ecology and our uh, soil here, where, whereas you get up to north of Mantua, and you've got a more, much more diverse forest? Yeah, indeed. And, and that's it's pretty well all soils driven by this area is the pineries. Pine are uh, uh, they aren't very demanding in terms of what they need for nutrients, and they generally like well-drained soils, and that's what our sandy soils give us. They don't have much nutrient capacity. They're 
fact, in some cases, excessively well drained. And there's the saying, the nature of pouring a vacuum, or if you build it, they will come. <laughs> if, you, if you create the right conditions, the site will be occupied. And the only tree species that really can occupy those sites and thrive are the pines. And it's driven primarily by soils and to a lesser extent by climate. So then, which is the years of the uh, of having a, a pine plantation, so to speak, uh, that is acidified uh, the soil enough to uh, harm any other species? Or? No, it, uh, that, would, that wouldn't be a correct characterization. There is some acidification that takes place, and um, but not to the to the extent of prohibiting pines from growing. And again, pines have evolved over thousands and thousands of years uh, to growing under these conditions and growing and under essentially a perpetual pine forest that they're adapted to that. Uh, the natural disturbance of pine forest, particularly red pine and jack pine, is fire. And that, that uh, ameliorates some of that acidification as well. There is a case where if you have a hardwood forest, think of like a sugar maple forest, or even a sugar maple hemlock forest, and if that was, you have a wind event, and part of it blows down or it gets harvested, and pines come in naturally, in that case, the pines will actually change the soil. And you can go back in time, look at a soil profile, and you can see where there's a certain band in the soil where, ah, something has flipped here, but there's the presence of this layer that suggests at one time this was a hardwood soil, and now it's a softwood soil. So it does happen, but again, it's over such long periods of time, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that it's a threat. It's not a threat, it's a naturally occurring process. Well, at one time, was not the, the sugar maple, I mean, one of the dominant species? Sure, in fact, what uh, a really neat study um, what they did was they went back to the old surveyor's records and where the surveyors were going through, going across Wisconsin in the mid-1800s. Every quarter mile or so, they would put in a corner post. They put this post here, and then they would mark what are called witness trees or boundary trees. And those trees would help, help the next surveyor come through and locate what the post was. Well, they're really, they're actually teams of really clever scientists went through and looked at all of those old survey notes. So went back 150 years and looked at the data to see what kinds of trees, what species they were seeing, and what were the sizes. And they used that data to, they call it a pre-settlement vegetation map. And the most dominant species, many people think it's pines across Wisconsin, the most dominant species, sugar maple and hemlock, followed by yellow birch. Those were the most prevalent tree species. In, in Wisconsin. It's just in this particular area, pines were dominant, and again, primarily because of the soil. And the like, they're not here that much. No, and, and what's interesting about the hemlock, in fact, it's estimated that between what was present, pre-settlement, and what we have now, we have probably less than 2% of hemlock. And, and with hemlock, uh, that's, that's an interesting story beautiful big stands of hemlock, and these trees were harvested. What were they harvested for? Rose. Pardon? Rose. No. In part? In part, they, they used some of the... They used them for roads in a lot of the swampy and boggy areas. Yep, they used them for corduroy roads. Main reason, because the wood wasn't good for anything else. But know what the primary thing they were after? Tanning. Yeah. The bark. Hemlock bark was really high in tannin. And you think of think of Wisconsin and the economy, right? We, Southeast Wisconsin had a huge leather industry. And all the tanning of that leather, the, the raw material for that tanning process came from our hemlock trees. So there, there would be areas where just swaths of hemlock would be felled, the bark peeled off, loaded up, shipped down, and the logs just left there to rot. And hemlock is a really quirky species. When you think of our other conifers, think of our spruces and our firs and our pines, these are tree species that after the glaciers retreated, they pretty well came in from the north. In the case of hemlock, 
we're at the most kind of the most northerly and the most westerly part of its range. The heart of the, the hemlock range is actually in Appalachia. So we're starting to creep out of its range. And often we think of conifers as being sort of these real cold weather species. Not true with hemlock. It's more of a more of a southern uh, type of conifer. And as a result, it has some really unique characteristics. It has some re unique requirements for germination. So once that hemlock and that seed source, by and large, was removed, it's very difficult to get it back. And a lot of times, in fact, a lot of the land management agencies that have hemlock on its property, they don't do any active management on it because they can't ensure that they will be able to perpetuate it or regenerate it. What does it need? What does it need? Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, again, it's a southern species. So it's, uh, have you ever seen a hemlock cone? Yeah. Yep, yeah, right, just tiny little cone. Very big tree. Yeah, exactly, this beautiful big tree, tiny little cone. And the cone is hygroscopic, it, it, which means is that the, the, the cone is really like a series of scales and the seeds are tucked up underneath the scales. So when the conditions are right, when we have warm temperatures and high humidity, those scales will open to release the seeds. And the seeds require, generally, they require uh, moist, warm, nutrient-rich environment. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> that happens in all order. But believe it or not, what you found, and the way that hemlock, well, you think, well, geez, you know, they were here, how did they get here one time? And it's it, it's a really neat, it's a neat cycle or a neat story. They're, they're, their ecology is such that if you had a large hemlock tree in the forest, most likely it would top, its fate would be determined by wind. A wind storm would go through and it would fall over. And as it fell over, there would be this tip up mound. And as you, have you ever gone and seen in the woods where trees have tipped over, there's a really high mound. Right. At the top of that mound is the perfect spot for a hemlock seed to germinate. Because the difference between up here and down here, we call that microclimate. And it could be the difference between life and death, between a late season frost up here, it won't freeze, down there, it might. The second thing is that when that soil flips over and it tips up, you have the mixing of the nutrients and that exposed mineral soil is just a wonderful seedbed for that seedling to get uh, developed. So you have all of the ingredients mineral soil, the nutrients, the moisture, and it's perfect and it allows the tree to take off and grow. We don't, our, our forestry practices as we go through now, commercial forestry practices, we are creating those tip-up mounds. And as a result, it's very difficult to get hemlock to come back. Hemlock has an additional oh, challenge, and that challenge is white-tailed deer. Some ecologists refer to hemlock as being an ice cream species. <laughs> that means that it's very palatable to deer, but it doesn't offer the most nutrition. And, then, and there's, some de there's some debate here on, you know, are deer really the culprits or not? Um, I would say it's, they're clearly an influence. And uh, with our higher deer populations, any hemlock that do get established, and then they have to run the gauntlet of deer be able to get up and grow high up. Is so there anything more else you look at you pretty close to one another that way? Um, they look similar uh, in terms of deer feeding yeah. on them? Very much so. Yeah. yeah, very much so. The U you're referring to is called Canada U, and it is another really delicacy. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a delicacy. If you see, if you're a deer hunter and you're going through the woods and you see you, you might as well keep walking because it's probably a sign there aren't any deer on <laughs> yes. So with climate change, particularly in the West, we're seeing a lot of interactions between insects, invasive and otherwise. What, what sort of emerging problems up here? Uh, a really good question, and I don't know if you heard the question. Um, a gentleman commented that with climate change, particularly out West, seeing some neat interactions. Maybe neat is the wrong word. Mm -hmm. Seeing some interesting interactions between changing climate and insect pests. And the, 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 perhaps the, oh, that's the word I'll use, 
showcase example is the mountain pine beetle. Uh, if you can travel out west, you'll see vast areas, mountain sites, just red. And it's a result of this beetle. It's a wood boring beetle that goes in, feeds around the, the circumference of the pine tree, and in the process, as it, what it does is it girls the tree, and the tree dies and turns red. And uh, mountain pine beetle has a uh, temperature threshold right around 40 degrees below zero. And normally, up in our alpine climates, up in the west, getting up also into Canada, you would have spells of 40 below zero during the winter. And as a result, um, pine beetle, not a threat. That might be present in just small areas, but you wouldn't have that epidemic. And what we've seen is with the changing climate, we are getting those cold winters. And as a result, this, this what's been endemic population of mountain pine beetle has essentially flourished and become an epidemic. Are we seeing the same sort of things here? Not to the same extent of mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle, there's a big concern that once it crosses the, the Rocky Mountains, it can just essentially move just like a tsunami right across the country, taking old pine trees, everything in its way. It has a sister species or a related species, southern pine beetle. So mountain pine beetle might be one that is, you might say, on our horizon, um, but it's quite likely many years old. What we're seeing in terms of insect pests that are um, are posing threats, things like emerald ash borer, and you likely heard about emerald ash borer. Uh, we're seeing some others. Um, Gypsy moth, to a lesser extent, gypsy moth is another one. It's been around a long time. Uh, its populations can be kept in check by really cold winters. But with the absence of cold winters, we haven't been, uh, we're seeing essentially gypsy moth maintained at, at a steady level. Those are, I guess, the immediate ones. Susan, can you think of any others that, yeah, I would think perhaps Emerald Ash War would be one that would thrive under a warming climate and uh, gypsy moth perhaps becoming more prevalent. And, and you, you raise a really interesting point. What we're seeing, uh, we've got these really neat environments. And it isn't just one thing. It isn't just human activity that's having an impact on the environment. It's human activity along with changing climate, along with more invasive species coming on. So we have all of these multiple factors that are interacting and changing, changing our ecosystems. And as a result, these, th these agents, including us, we're being changed by them as well. So it's this, um, it's like this wonderfully complex ecological spaghetti where they're all just all intertwined and interconnected. And when we think, oh, okay, you know, climate change is just causing this. The scientific community often refers to it as being non-linear. It's not like, okay, we're going to go from X to Y. The, the relationship is much more complex than that. And it's, a, it's a really a, uh, some might say it's a discouraging time to be a scientist. But scientists, it's also a fascinating time because the challenges we face are really complex. And it requires the scientific community to work essentially as teams because our problems aren't just single disciplinary problems, when you think about it, but they're interdisciplinary problems. So it makes it to be a very exciting time to be a scientist. Yes? What's the possibility that we could, you know, we're losing the ice that we did a year ago, sort of from early. Uh, the weather's getting warmer. I live in the middle of a tree forest. You know, there's essentially no grass other than our blacktop. And we watch what's happening out in the Mountain West. And I remember hearing about the Peshtigo fire and oh, that's, a, that's a different problem. But mm -hmm. Could we ever reach a point where, you know, it's, a, it's probably weather dependent. We have a year after year of drought and the whole thing goes up. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not, you know, we're just as vulnerable. As they are out in the West. The our, our ecosystems are um, they're a little bit different. And they aren't as um, 
the earth is fire dependent. Um, uh, ecologically, uh, both yeah, spice and the ball. The well, Old West, the, the, the sort of the sort of the chaparral species that they have, those species have evolved with fire over years and years and years. And the problems that we have is that we have this essentially fire dependent ecosystem where now there's a whole bunch of houses in the middle of it. And that's, you can think of it as sort of this, this conflict. In our area, the major, the major disturbance that we have here is not wildfire. Our major disturbance is wind and wind event. And they estimate, ecologists estimate, that anywhere from, oh, maybe one half to perhaps as much as 5% of the landscape is affected by wind. So given that, that, that long-term history, I don't know that we would see fire as being a real threat here. It could, if, if the climate does change that dramatically, we do have an extended period of drought. Think back to the spring, 9,000 acre fire to the west of us here. You know, it could happen, particularly if we have such a diffuse uh, human impact. Most of our fires are caused by humans, our wildfires. Out west, many of them are caused by lightning strikes. So it's a bit different. Fire could be a uh, could be a future threat, but I really think that um, in the scale of things, perhaps not to the same extent as what we see out west. One, one interesting aside on fire: um, we had some uh, study done a while ago where um, they, they took lake cores, cores of lake sediment, and of course lakes are basins that are low water flows in collects things. And you can actually analyze the cores for charcoal, which is produced by fire. And so they looked over time, um, going back, I don't know, a thousand years or some long period of time, and looked at when the fires were. They also can reconstruct climate based on pollen and other signals. Um, and they found that prior to about the 1930s or 40s, I think it was, there was a good relationship between dry periods, like you know, five or eight or 10 year droughts, um, and the occurrence of charcoal in the sediments. But once we got into the era of fire suppression, um, the relationship between whether we were in a drought period or not, and the amount of charcoal in the sediments just disappeared. So fire suppression has really changed the, the frequency of fires um, in, in this area. There are probably lots of small fires. I think the average, the DNR statistics, I think the average fire size uh, here in northern Wisconsin is less than an acre. And that's a tribute to the, the DNR, and when there is a fire, they're on it right away. Would part of that be to better manage some of the forests? Um, no, I, not necessarily. Um, if you consider protection and suppression as being part of that forest management, then yes. But the, the I don't think so. Um, no, I don't. I wouldn't draw that that conclusion. The the practice back at the turn of the 19th century was there would be these large harvests, clear cuts, and yeah. then Check. burning, yeah. right. and they would go through and burn. Um, we don't do that anymore, and as a result, there's we don't have the escaped fires. So perhaps in that sense, you could think of it as improved management. But it's not the, uh, the, the the tight link, perhaps that you might otherwise think. I think it's right exactly what Tim had described, just remarkable suppression efforts. The disadvantage, the downs, the flip side of all of the suppression is that some species are fire dependent species. Jack pine is one, and if we're really gung ho at you know, putting out every little fire, what we're doing is, and this is what's happening out west. We're allowing that fuel to build up, and build up, and build up. And rather than have perhaps smaller fires, more frequent fires, less intense fires, we're just having all of that tinder build up so that when there is a fire, it is literally scorched earth. Yeah, I mean, they're burning soil. That's that's the intensity. So the I guess it would be a, a, it's a much different system. Perhaps we describe it that way. So. I have a question.
question for all of you. I was going to switch gears, if that's okay, back to the fishery on uh, the rainbow smelt. How are those uh, transported or spread from one thing to another? Yeah, so the rainbow smelt, uh, fish should get to be about this big. Um, they're native to the northeastern U.S. They grow in lakes in Maine, but they also grow in the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Maine. Interesting species can tolerate a wide range of salinity. They were brought to the Midwest in the 1920s um, by the Conservation Department in Michigan, put into a lake, ironically called Crystal Lake in Michigan. Um, they were brought here to feed in walleyes. Um, they were thought to be a forage fish uh, for walleyes. Crystal Lake had a stream connection to Lake Michigan, so it wasn't long before the smelt were in Lake Michigan, in Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. And now there are smelting festivals um, and communities along the Great Lakes. That's all the basic species. Um, they were brought to into the inland lakes almost certainly by people. And whether it was intentional or unintentional is an open question. Um, people intentional, people could say, I'm tired of driving out what to Lake Superior to go smelting. Just dump them in a lake here. Or somebody had been smelting up in, in Lake Superior came back and were washing out their nets in the lake here and happened to have fertilized eggs. Or maybe some other some other mechanism. Um, but they're in they're in lakes like Sparkling Lake, they're in Crystal Lake, they're in a small lake in Northern Wilds County called Anderson Lake, they're in the Fence Lake system, um, and a few other lakes in the area. And the concern is that while it's true that adult walleye eat smell, it's also true that adult smelt eat baby walleyes. <laughs> <laughs> and so if the smelt get the upper hand, see there's a lot of fishing pressure in the walleye population is hit. The smelt get the upper hand, they'll keep the walleye from successfully producing the year class. They'll produce they'll produce the eggs and the fry, but the fry all get eaten before they get to be adults. And that's the concern. Um, so in a lake like Sparkling Lake, for example, the only reason there are walleye in Sparkling Lake is because of the <coughs> arms They haven't successfully reproduced since something like 1988 or something like that. So it's it's one of these species that not many people know about. It's sort of on the radar. It's just coming onto the radar. Um, but it's a real species of concern for us. And in fact, we have a project going on now where we're actually trying to eliminate rainbow smelt from a lake that is, where it's become established on Crystal Lake. Um, and we're doing that by trying to alter the environment of Crystal Lake such that it's no longer suitable for, for the smell. That's, that's that's the cool. the there. I'm sorry? Crystal Lake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of um, near Saner, between yeah, Saner right. and Boulder Junction. Yeah. Is that the one where you're trying to... Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reverse of the water. Yeah, basically we have some backyard trampoline-sized things that we can either cause to be buoyant or not. And when they're not, they sink. And when they're buoyant, they rise. And when they rise, they bring up the cold water from the bottom. When they sink, they bring the top. Changing the environment. And so, smelt need cold water. And if we can eliminate the cold water at the bottom of Crystal Lake, um, the idea is that the smelt will no longer be able to to live there. And so we're in the second of three years of mixing. The first year was the last year where it was kind of a warm year. We thought we think we killed somewhere around 50% of the smelt with a wide margin of uncertainty. <laughs> a wide margin of uncertainty. Um, and this year's been a little colder, so I don't know that we're as successful this year as last year, but we'll find out. The data will tell us. I don't know if you have a Um, well, um, you observe them. <laughs> no, 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 people observe them. And the, the DNR does fish surveys in lakes around here from time to time. Um, most avid anglers will, will know. Um, they, they run um, in the spring, and so you can sometimes see them um, massing up on the shoreline in the, in the spring. Sometimes it's under the ice. I remember fishing for them on uh, uh, Fence Lake yeah. in the spring by the little rivers, okay? And it was great. It was marvelous. 
Now, we still have walleyes in the chain. Is that because of the stocking, or is there a neutral deal so, here? So that's interesting. So so I, I mentioned that the, the adult walleye eat the smell, but the adults not eat the baby walleye. So it's which species has the upper hand, and the walleye are pretty intensively stocked. And so they've gotten, they used to be that the walleyes were going down in the lake chain, and the smelt were up. And now it's the, the walleyes have gotten the upper hand, at least as of what, five years. So nature needs some help in this case. Perhaps. Or whatever. Perhaps. It's just a, it's just imagine what this area would be like economically um, if the walleye fishery went away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that will happen with the, with the uh, water uh, warming. That will happen. Yeah, but that'll take a while. Yeah. That'll take a while. We have to. <laughs> so you were talking about like the emerald cash flow and climate change and um, living three quarters of the year down south in the Chicago area. What is it that people can do other than watching the city of Evanston come by and shut down all of her beautiful old trees because they've been invaded by what is it? it um, it's a really tough species uh, to prevent and protect against. And the strategies are, uh, I'll describe a few and some that worked and have not worked. Uh, if you have an ash tree in your yard first or on your property, be vigilant and monitor the tree's health. A healthy tree might have the ability, it has greater chance of off the insect. There are some, and they call them systemic insecticides. If you did have an infection that you could inject into the tree, that would protect that tree. But it's a very intensive measure that you could only do on a tree by tree basis. If you have an ash forest, that's in the yard, it, it's not feasible. What, uh, what the forestry community is doing, and they're trying to keep their ash trees as healthy as possible. In some cases, some managers are actually looking at, they have mature ash trees on their property now, and they're, they're reaching the end of their lifespan. They're going to harvest them now because they, they know that they're going to be on this downhill slide and the emerald ash borer is going to drive them down farther. In Ontario, the province of Ontario, they went um, ballistic is the word that comes to mind, but that might be a wrong term. They, they took a very drastic approach. For a 10 kilometer swath, six kilometers <coughs> wide, they went and they cut out every ash tree for a swath six miles wide and removed it all. And they thought, oh, think of it like a fire break. Well, we've got this emerald ash borer break. So aha, the emerald ash borer is marching up through Michigan and coming up into Ontario, they'll hit this break and the rest of Ontario will be saved. I don't think the, the, the last you know, chainsaw had stopped from cutting all those ash trees when the emerald ash borer was found on the other side of that barrier. And the same strategy was done many years ago with chestnut and it didn't work then. These are um, very adaptable insects and combine them with highly mobile population, particularly people who move in firewood, it's a really difficult thing to prevent against. So the, the biggest thing is if you, if you burn firewood, don't bring it from Illinois or from an infected area. Stay local, use local wood. And on a, an individual tree basis, you might be able to do something on a larger forestry uh, scale. I have a question. I actually have two questions for you. So um, you're here in this room. You're up in the north. But some of you live here. Some of you are just visiting. Um, think of, of the the primary concept that draws you or, or has you here. Whether it's you know, the environment, serenity, fishing, your friends, your family. Think, think of that primary concept to give you a chance to think about that. And the second question is, 
think about what is your primary concern if you have any concerns about this area. Give you a chance to think about that. Because it would be interesting for Tom and I to, um, to hear both sort of what, what you like about the area and what you're concerned about. Before this is not a formal quiz. And you have all passed. Have something in mind? Just well, I like it because of what it is and the environment itself. Uh, Bylas County here, uh, to me, is special. Uh, special because we don't have ATVs. It's a nice, I'm involved in quite some uh, endeavors in the woods. And uh, that I love. And that I want, I want to remain there. Okay, let's go with the Positive concepts first, and then come back. Well, positive because it's yeah, got it. No, I know, I know that. But I thought you were going to come into a concern. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say other what other positive things. Solitude, solitude. Yeah. Peace and quiet. Yeah. Peace, Peace and quiet. quiet. So I survived the summer. <laughs> Snow. 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 Got it. Okay. Yes. Right. Wrong season. Yeah. <laughs> The diversity of uh, birds, plants, just the okay. makeup of the yeah. the environment up here, just uh, special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trees. The trees. The trees. 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 Okay. What about the what concerns? What's, what are the trends concerns? on your on the maps? Calculation. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Machines. Machines. Motorized sports. Motorized sports. <laughs> well, water quality. That, uh, water quality. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Okay, global warming. That's scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Traffic and development. Traffic and Comparatively development. Comparatively little, but nonetheless. We're encouraging all these people. Well, and to a certain extent, well, to a large extent, the economy depends on it. Right. Right. Well, it's a love hate relationship. Yeah. The people that come here really don't have a <coughs> care for the nature, for everything that is around them, but I just. Ex care. Except that they're here because of it. Yeah, yeah, well. But they don't care about it. Respect. They don't respect it. But it's not, perhaps they don't have the same sense of place as somebody that's.
talks about that. He's very concerned. Certainly, the people that are managing the national forests have that, that same type of concern. So it's you know, and it's, you know, for the wolf thing, you know, there's there are multiple sides. For well, for any issue, there's there's multiple, multiple sides. And one of the reasons that Tom and I and Mary and others wanted to start this kind of session is to be able to have conversations about these kinds of issues um, where, um, where potentially contentious issues could be discussed in a way that um, you know we can bring out the we can bring out the multiple sides of issues rather than having you know, the contrast to that is the way a lot of our discussions in the Northwoods go, which is debating letters to the editor in the local paper. <laughs> out of mind and it's on hard pack frozen surfaces. Right. So it's less of an issue. Less of an issue. I guess what's contentious about like the ATVs are there's only two counties in the state that do not allow ATVs in our county that strong. And the pressure is on immensely right now. It's on all sides of violence iron and price and uh, I don't know what it took to solve but just they, it's it's like a Plummet, they just want to pick. And that pressure is likely to increase, particularly mm -hmm. with the, that pressure is likely to increase, oh, you particularly do. with the changing climate. Yes. And, and as we see where, um, if I was a snowmobile dealer, I'd be nervous. Mm -hmm. Just with the way that our snow falls and our winters have been mm -hmm. changing, and, and again, we have a tourism-based economy, and, and some folks are actually looking at ATVs as being a substitute or a complement. Well, they're trying to set up a trail system right now through the North Island and some of these other uh, uh, beautiful, pristine areas just for ATVs. And, uh, I, you know, I had a chance to travel and spend time in Colorado and to see what these machines will do to the environment is absolutely scary. It really is. It isn't how fast you get up the how deep you can make your ruts on your way up. And uh, it's not a very safe. Yeah, it's not a very, it's a very noisy safe. Not everybody on the ATV is like that. And there's families that go out there and truly uh, enjoy themselves. But they put those great big uh, lug tires on there for a reason. You know, I, I, you, I think probably been up here longer than me, but I first moved up here in the, in the I don't know, 1980, and at that time, you know, snowmobiles were starting to, to flourish, mm -hmm. and there was some contention and concern because the trail systems weren't well established, mm -hmm. and snowmobiles were going kind of hither and yon, and, 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 and mm -hmm. going across the property and all that, and then the, the trail systems kind of became established. I had the sense that the snowmobile clubs kind of self-policed Oh, yes, it, and now it's, to me, it seems like a pretty orderly kind of thing, you know, from my perspective. Um, that um, you know, there's not a lot of, I mean, there's the occasional clash of right, this or that, but, but for the most part, that's sort of been worked out. And, and one wonders with the ATV issue, I'm not pro or con, it's whether, um, you know, if ATVs were to, to become more prevalent, whether there wouldn't be ways of, of having some of the same self-policing to, to try to get at that sort of issue that, that you had talked about. I've never believed, no matter what the venue, that you put the fox here to guard the house. <laughs> they also want to drive on all the roads, local roads. Yeah. Uh, I've been to a town and they have that. And it's, it's really scary every time you go to visit my daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. 
kid's seven, eight years old, like that. Well, <laughs> in the back room. <laughs> do you have any practical suggestions about what we can all do to, to help wildlife in general on our own little, you know, God's green acre? Like, I, I've been coming to the North Woods since I was a child. And I mean, there's just obviously a, an obvious decline in, in snakes and frogs and toads. In, in fireflies, in bats, in bird species, and, and, and you know, in my own little place, I try to do what I can, but it, it just doesn't seem to be succeeding. Part of that is just uh, the result of natural succession in your forest, and even if there weren't people on the landscape, just the way that forest changes over time, that habitat is going to change over time. And, what might have been attractive to a whole suite of species at one time is going to change and, and disappear, and then will become attractive to a different suite of species. So some of the change that you're seeing can be perfectly natural. Some of it might be driven by uh, changes in the habitat around you. What, uh, and there's a number of uh, outstanding programs designed just for woodland owners or property owners. In fact, there's a workshop coming up in another week here called Cupboards, and it's, it, the focus is essentially how to manage your property for wildlife. What is it that you are interested in? Are you interested in? It doesn't have to be just game species. Are you interested in <coughs> sound birds? And really what it comes down to is finding out, identifying what are the things that you would like to see on your property, and then creating that habitat, sort of that field of dreams analogy, you know, building it and, and hopefully it will come. The challenge though, is that you have to be realistic with your objectives. It, you can't expect to have a sort of a Noah's Ark type of property where you've got everything there. And, and trying to match your objectives to what is the capacity, the ecological capacity of the land. There are, there are opportunities. It's just a matter of being a, a good steward. One example, and it goes back to the comment that Tim made earlier, you know, our tendencies as humans is to go through and clean things up. Well, I was trained as a forester, and, and, and this is many years ago, if we saw a dead tree standing in the woods, well, that was waste. That was a tree that could have made lumber or paper. Now, the phrase is, there's a lot of life in a dead tree. And we realize that those snags an important part, while that tree might be unhealthy, it's part of keeping the whole forest healthy. So maintaining different components like that, but such as snakes. Look at the snakes. explosion of the biomass industry, which they talk about cleaning up the forest floors and using that debris for energy. Yep, yep. You, you've, and I don't know if you heard the, the woman's comment about uh, biomass and, and biofuel energy. There's, it's. Uh, process is actually going through and harvesting, trying to harvest as much woody material as possible so that it could either be burned as fuel or potentially converted into cellulosic uh, ethanol. And there's some real concerns over what are the, um, what are the thresholds that how much biomass could we, could we remove and do it in a way that we do not damage the ecological integrity uh, of that particular landscape. And, and the challenge that we have really is going back again to what Tim alluded, we have all of these multiple values that we're trying to manage this resource and do it in a way that we still, we still are able to enjoy and make use of that environment but do so without damaging that ecological integrity. Every living thing on this planet, doesn't matter if you're a toadstool, wildflower, bear or bald eagle, every living thing depends on its environment. No exclusions, and we're no different. But what we have to do as society is we have to recognize that we're depending on our environment, but through the process of our dependence, we're changing it, and how can we be, as all the Leopold put it, 
how can we view ourselves as being an integral component of that environment as opposed to being sort of a, the environment is our dominion and we're going to just extract the resources. Of it. So it's that, I think that greater integration we need to look at. But there's, you raise a good uh, observation, a good point about the biomass industry. And it will come down to competing values and hopefully a, a process that is my bias, science-based and fair, that will determine these are the thresholds or this is what we can do uh, in order to support such such efforts or such economic activity. There you talk about a um, you know, big word, common word, and you've heard it is sustainability. And there are three pillars to sustainability, sociological, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. And what we need to do is develop systems that allow all three of those to survive, not just one. And that's, I would argue, that's really the, the foundation of our survival. Now for my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is that uh, workshop or talk that you said about? Uh, it'll start next um, Thursday. Um, the rub, though, is that uh, they keep the class size small, and you have to register, uh, and it's fully subscribed for this year. But I can take your contact information and um, send you some information so that you can register for it for next year. They're already fully okay. subscribed for this year. <coughs> yep. Have you participated in it? The, uh, it's uh, just a wonderful team of instructors, and again, the whole focus is you and your property, what are your objectives, mm -hmm. with a specific focus on wildlife, and what can you do to achieve those objectives. It's three, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, three days. I believe I heard, uh, I don't know if it's this discussion or if it's enacted but uh, about increasing the number of walleyes uh, uh, planted in the lakes and I think part of that was uh, to support uh, tourism and economic uh, strength of the north and I was wondering if there are concerns with that as well. Um, so I'm I'm probably not the one to answer that. Um, the uh, um, certainly stocking fish as, as a tried and true management practice. It's expensive and it's sort of one off. You do it you do it a bit of time. And I think that from my understanding of what the fisheries managers in the area would like to do is to um, try to Assess sort of on a lake by lake basis what kind of fishery can this lake sustain naturally. And not all lakes are going to be trophy walleyes. And manage the lakes to have nature helping the management rather than having the managers fight against nature by stocking something at a level that, that can't be sustained. So I think that's more the direction that the managers are going to go. But Susan or, or Noah, do you have? I think I'd agree with that. Is there anybody else in the room? I was going to say, there's just something on the TV within the last couple of days that um, the state has received, I don't know, there's some money somewhere that they're, they're trying to change the, uh, where they rear all these, uh, these fish and so they can stock larger fish. The, that was what the, yeah, the, the, the success rates for stocking larger fish are way higher than budget bill was to make the, money yeah, the model for a number of the state fish hatcheries just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the story I heard is of this it's, it's, it's like an economic investment that by, by stocking more of the, of the walleye the increase in the tourism yes. and, and the activity will be worth it. And the, that may well be true. Well that yeah. you know, but to the extent that we can use natural processes 
aiding that. Science on, Science on Tap website. Will yep. We've transitioned um, So over. you can go to that. Then you should be able to go to all of the others. The only exception is the one in June, because of the construction on Highway 51, the internet service to uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the night that we did it. So that one we, we dismissed, but all the others are available. Um, and Mary often streams them live here in the library on the same night. So if you don't want to fight the crowd at the brewery, and the streaming web, yeah, the streaming website is set up that you can actually Mary could ask questions for folks. Yeah, if folks had questions, we watch the stream at the brewery so that we can get questions from people that are remotely watching it. We were um, absolutely overwhelmed by the interest and participation of the community when we first approached the brewery. You know, could, could we you know, use part of your room? Their first question was, how many people do you expect? You're right. That was the heartening part of it all, to see that there were that many people willing to come out. And we thought there'd be, like, what do we have here? Maybe 25 yeah. people or something. We, that's what we said. Yeah. Maybe a couple dozen. Oh, yeah, you can just take that upper part. <laughs> and so all people are just coming. And as you said, it was just overwhelming. It was it was uncomfortable for the people who came. I think the Alumni Association, the Alumni Association did a wonderful job. 
yeah, the mortgage is really, yeah, they're a really important partner for us. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good event. Um, I think the attendance, you know, I think that'll sort of, we're thinking that that'll level out. There'll be some people that'll be discouraged. Um, that will, you know, and, and it'll start to become less novel. And the subject, that's true too. Yeah. The subject, the subject, and the subject, it matters, the subject matters too, for sure. Sure. But I hope that you'll give us another chance. We had some growing pains. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to Volker's presentation, Volker is uh, again an interesting fellow. He's traveled all over the world. In fact, just a week or so, he's got back from Argentina. What, he's a conservation biologist, among many things. And he studies how different land uses change landscapes and what that means. And um, the focus of his presentation in September, this is going to be a much more broad view, He'll be talking about some of his, of his work in China and Russia, two spots in the world with really emerging and growing uh, economies, and what have been some of the challenges and uh, some of the changes that he's witnessed and experienced uh, in those different landscapes. And these are some of the most wild, pristine landscapes on the planet. So it should be a, uh, he's a wonderful storyteller, so it should be a fun, fun evening of stories and some neat insights as well. And if you come to the brewery company and have dinner either before or after, mention that you're there for Science on Tap and get 10% off. <laughs> Thank hey, thanks so much for uh, for stopping by and being here.